we have about 50 minutes for a question and answer session with the Premier, and I just want to first of all say thank you, Premier, for that wonderful speech that really gave a full view of the new government, um, all of your priorities, the vision, and then, you know, they always say, put your money where your mouth is, and then obviously all the projects that will help to accomplish that as well. Um, one thing that I thought was very interesting in that the conversation that you mentioned about the GDP and being in management for many, many years now, the one thing that I've found is that you can't manage what you don't measure. And the fact that you spoke about the GDP and the continuous growth, and if that's the only measurement, are you really achieving everything else that needs to be accomplished as well? So the fact that you're looking at other factors to make sure it's sustainable in the way we move forward is really, I think, the first time um, I've heard a premier put it in that context. And I even remember many years ago having a conversation with a, with a local economist that was actually speaking about economic growth and the individual likened it to a train going uphill. And now that train is going downhill and we have to be very careful about how you put on the brakes because you don't want it to careen off the tracks and then you can't get that miracle back on the tracks. And in the conversation, it was actually speaking about, okay, that, that is true. However, if you run over all of the indigenous Caymanians on the way to your destination by that train going so fast, and you reach your destination, but you don't have enough Caymanians that were able to hop onto that train, have you really achieved your goals? And that imagery was playing in my head as you were speaking, in that you were talking about not stopping the train, but managing that train so as many Caymanians as possible can jump on that train to get us to that destination together. So I, I thank you for that. And um, it really made the connections for me. Now, Premier, we have a few questions that I'm going to ask, and I have my sheet here because we have them prepared before. And it's my pleasure to be able to sit here and ask our first female Premier. So congratulations on that as well. Our first female Premier again, all right? <laughs> Um, so, as I said, congratulations on that. And also, I'd, you would be the first premier, obviously, from, from Cayman Brac as well. And a lot of times we hear about the vision um, in regards to the Cayman Islands as a, as a whole and where you know, we want to go. So the first order of business is to actually ask about Cayman Brac. And you, if you want to leave a lasting imprint on what the BRAC will look like 10, 15, 20 years from now, what's that imprint you want to leave and what industries do you wish to actually occur or not occur in the BRAC in order that your vision would be achieved? Thank you very much, Tamari. I guess this is the test of the welcome in here at the chamber. <laughs> Um, obviously, I'm always extremely delighted to talk about the entire Cayman Islands, but especially delighted to talk about my constituency, um, my jurisdiction of origin. And I don't necessarily foresee it as leaving a footprint, because there is going to be a leaving in a few months' time, and I'm going to be singing that Andy Martin song of packing up and going back to the BRAC again. And so the only leaving from the back will be in my imminent departure from this world to the other world. But having prefaced what I'm going to say is that I've always envisioned the BRAC to be um, that island which was a, a mid-situation between what we refer in Cayman Brac to Grand Cayman as the big city and Little Cayman that we see more as the R&R, &R, environmental friendly island. And so because of that, we try to develop very incrementally and balance our development with our economy. But we are also understand that there's a fine line between faith and foolishness. So to that end, we welcome properly planned and fully resourced development. It's always been a long-term dream that um, some tertiary institution, for example, would come and develop on Cayman Brac. What that means is that it would bring 
not only New Dini into the territory of only 2,200 um, persons, but it would bring a strong exchange um, of intellectual capacity. And, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that iron sharpens iron. But it would also free up the summer months and this, the Christmas and the Easter for our local people to enjoy um, what's there. And those intellectual persons seeking to enhance their academic ability would then become the agents of change. And perhaps that the Minister of Tourism would not have to seek millions of dollars from public or private sector to let the whole world know that Cayman is still one of the best little jurisdictions in the world. And so that has been a dream. I also believe that um, we will probably, no time in the near future, have a vibrant financial services center. Um, and how do I know that? Because from way back when I first was elected, we put in incentives to where it's near nil to incorporate and do many things over in Cayman Brat. But until um, COVID came, most people didn't take that short journey to Cayman Brat. And I'm happy to say that many of you who have taken it have now bought real estate there. It's caused the price to go up for my local people. But we always welcome good investment. And I want to put that out first and foremost. Um, we're not there to say that we just want the whole Cayman back to remain green as Columbus found it on the 10th of May, 1503. But we want to ensure that the development is sustainable and it benefits developer because it's a business, they need a profit, but it also concurrently benefits the local population. We have been experiencing a brain drain for many years, and that's why you see here in your um, edifices and indeed your businesses, a lot of your leaders would have hailed from Cayman Brack. And because education has been that password, long before password was the terminology that was a catchy word, that if we wanted to get out of Cayman Brack, if we wanted to be successful and not just be receiving a fish, we had to learn to fish, and we thought that the best spawning area was education. And that's why now as Minister of Education, I make no apologies that I will invest in education because that is the key. If Mandela said, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance, and I'm not tr about trying ignorance. So um, we can agree to disagree, but certainly while the Lord gives me the honor and privilege to lead the government that I now lead, I would not only like to see Grand Cayman have wonderful um, educational infrastructures and programs and curriculum to go along with that, that are people-centered and that is based on the needs of the private sector. That is the dream for there. As far as domestic tourism is, we saw that during COVID, it worked. That we couldn't get off the island, but we could get to Little Cayman, we could get to Cayman Brat. That is a dream that I have and that people will see the sister islands as the gems that they are, that they will share the, the lucrative um, remittances that oftentimes go all overseas. Give some of them to Cayman Airways or go in your luxurious boat. Hopefully when we can get appropriate boat and port facilities there that you can come. And I believe that um, by, we don't have the canals that you have down here, but we do have sufficient areas that we can get proper port or ports there to allow our own people and visitors alike to share um, your registered boat at Joel's at Mesa and come and dock it on the brat. It would not only be a learning experience, it would provide jobs for people, it would help your blood pressure, we don't have any traffic, we don't have any big numbers that you hear um, elsewhere with crime. That is my dream. Let it not only be my footprints, but plan your vacation this year to leave some footprints on Cayman Brat. And Premier, um, I have, just because you obviously were speaking about education as well, the second question on here, knowing that your hat for now many years um, outside of now being Premier would have been Education Minister. Um, how has the education system in the Cayman Islands been reformed to align with the evolving needs of the economy and what initiatives are in place to bridge the skills gap? Well, first and foremost, I found a very deficient infrastructural arrangement. And I saw it from an incremental perspective to put funds and lobby to get funds to, um, first of all, improve and do the brand new high school here, which stands heads and shoulders in a high school anywhere in the world. Um, and then I noticed that the morale for the teachers were extremely low 
And I'm not here to say what was the cause for that. I'm just giving you what I found when I visited all my schools, and I do visit all of my schools, some plan and some ad hoc for obvious reasons. And so at our very first um, August meeting, Return of the Teachers and Orientation, I went out on the limb and got into the um, Section 55 DG under a constitution where I thought that it was high time that teachers were paid a minimum of $5,000. And even that, we know, if you're honest, cannot really cut it in the Cayman that we live in today. But it was a start. And then, of course, you know I wasn't going to stop there, so I went out this year, uh, last year, August, to say that they, those who are affected by that domino effect, that there would be work done, and work is now being done for the assistant teachers, the depth of principals, the principals, to ensure that we're not losing them. And how do I know that worked? Because fortunate for us, and perhaps unfortunate for private sector, we're getting now teachers from the private sector come over to the government who wants to be in our education system. The other thing I noticed was that there was no real standardization of examinations, and so I could not really appropriately defend um, the accusations or the allegations that Caymanian education was substandard to those who were coming here. So I took, I believe it was two trips, and I think you might have been on one of them, to the United Kingdom to look at their curriculum. And I was impressed with what I saw. We brought it back and we rolled it out for K through six, and we have started to roll out for the high school. And so what that means is that the same thing that they're teaching um, in the United Kingdom, although we were taking some of the examinations, we didn't get the adaptation or the adoptions thereof, we can now say that if we get a, a grade A in Cayman, it is truly a grade A. There is no infusion of a um, discretionary or subjective um, interference by their teacher, um, by intent or otherwise, and so I'm happy to see that that's standardized. And then we saw, before I knew that COVID was coming, a short time before, we had rolled out computers for all of our teachers. And I moved on from that. I was shocked, I must tell you, that I did get for all of the teachers. So I went and then I asked for 5,200 laptops for my students. And I got an even bigger shock because I saw PM Hollis in Jamaica having a big, big event because he had either 20 or 22 handing out. And of course, Jamaica have millions of people. So whoever still say that Cayman and can't lead, then they need to go to some optimist, I believe. But <laughs> we, if we are going to continue to say that we are the number one jurisdiction of choice. Education has to be seen as a pivotal, significant, and key factor in that, because it will lead to social unrest. We've seen from our neighboring countries in Bermuda and Bahamas, Jamaica and other sister um, countries and brother countries in the Caribbean. Cayman don't want to be a follower. We want to continue to be leaders. And there is sufficient space in our economic pie for education to be the hub and the lubricant for it. And that is my ultimate goal, that we can have a symbiotic relationship, not one that's merely an osmosis that we hope that some, by some ad hoc arrangement, maybe the natives may get an education, or if they are compliant, they may get a little extra piece of land or a little second-hand car. We have long gone that Nikkei Man development. We want to be equal partners, and I believe that because we have over 123 plus different nationalities, it shows, Minister, that K-Mankind is working, and my grandmother often said, it takes two hands to clap. Let's get those two hands together, and may this be the genesis of that hand clapping. And Premier, um, also just like you to touch on, just because a lot of times people don't quite understand, the same way you would have had the curriculum changed so that an A is an A regardless, from the Office of Educational Standards as well, when schools are inspected, can you just give a little, a brief synopsis of where we were when you started office from that grading perspective of government schools um, to where we are today? and obviously the fact that it's international inspectors that come in. So the grade we get here is the same grade you would have in the UK, Dubai, et cetera, et cetera. 
Absolutely, Shamari. Um, what we discovered as well, it was that the Office of the Education Standards was annexed their toe to education, and I thought it needed to be an arm's length arrangement. Mm -hmm. So it's now under POCS, the portfolio of the civil service. And so it's purely independent. Correct. And I can tell you that my um, administrators and technical staff in their um, schools, they get very nervous, and especially when they have a minister that actually go and ask for an inspection, and you get a lot of mitigation to not do it now, and I'm, my response is, why not now? Mm -hmm. And so I took the um, decision that I needed to know exactly where my schools were if I were going to make any type of improvement and a real positive impact, and that is what the modus operandi is. And so as we came on, the public service had weak schools. I'm happy to report today that there are three weak schools last year and all three were in the private sector. I don't celebrate that. And in fact, we met with them as we have the provision to do under the education law 2016 revised thereafter. And we offered, I think it was up to $100,000 with those three nameless schools to augment and enhance. And two of them have come up from out of the week, and we believe that one of them is well on the way to come out of that week's status. But currently, as we sit, um, and even though um, DG likes to say we have a lot of silent victories, one of those are is that government currently has no weak schools, and in fact, we have two good schools, and I expect that on the next inspection, that is even going to increase. I believe that John Gray will be an excellent school in short order. The, the other aspect of it, which remains outstanding, but I've still not given up on, is that I want to have a HR audit on all of my teachers because I've improved the instructor. I'm continuing to improve it. They're paid a competitive remuneration. Our students have moved from smart boards to promotion boards. We have done everything with IT because that is the future. So now it's time to test that other factor. Of course, I leave it to my good DP. He needs to do the work, at which he is continuing to do, with that third leg being the parents and the social aspect of it, which is probably going to be the greatest task because somewhere along the line, we had a um, cultural attitudinal change that a school is a nursery and we take care of the children. We're not responsible for them. That is changing. Right. And I'm happy to see it. It's slow progress, but it's in the right trajectory. Perfect. Thank you, Premier. And I actually got a, a question from the crowd as it has to do with um, education. And in speaking about the budget and, let's see, right. So if UPM um, needs an, and expects a private sector-led economy, um, what action is being taken to provide enough school space for company senior executives and their families wishing to move corporate headquarters here? The portion of the comment says this is a major roadblock right now to reinsurance companies wishing to relocate from Bermuda. Well, since we are in the arena of partnerships, it would make my day if some investor here in the room or some investors here in the room came and told me that you want to build a lovely private school. I'm sure my education department council, who's led by none other than Shamara, will be happy to entertain your application. <laughs> and now that you've got it loud and clear that we are a government who believes in balance and development and environment. But putting that lighter side apart, um, we, did, we, did, we do look at the trends. We do look at our registrations. And you will notice that um, the notice went out in the end of December that the month of February is going to be like a recess for them to assess where we are. Because the other transition, migratory um, phenomenon that we're seeing is that students from the private sector already on island are now coming in to our public schools. That's another test, LIPTUS test, to show that we're going in the right direction. Correct. Um, we've also um, had to adjust the Clifton Hunter High School and the um, John Gray High School to ensure that the capacity is increased. Obviously, there's still a limited capacity, but we got like another 139, I believe, if memory serves me right, and another 30 or 40 for Clifton Hunter. But what Clifton Hunter needs, and we are working on, is a fourth academy. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's going to take money, and I'm going to go back and ask for the money, and hopefully we can get it built in due time. What I can say is that we have assisted through our immigration reform. Remember before, you couldn't come unless you were in a private school. We did open that up 
but that has created capacity issues in some of the schools. Now, Barton Town still has quite a bit of capacity, mm -hmm. so if you're having difficulty, move up east. Move up east. <laughs> <laughs> Check his Go East initiative. Um, Easton still have some capacity, and Northside has some, and we're in the consultancy stage um, of developing a new primary school for Northside to accommodate for the um, minister's new housing project is there. So there's some visionary um, planning that's going on. Obviously, no one, and I mean no one, anticipated the population growth spurt that we saw since COVID-19. But as Cayman had, um, we're resilient in COVID. I'm sure when we put our minds together, we will come up to a solution, even if it's a temporary solution. And because one thing we learned from it was called remote working, which I'm still not quite a formidable advocate for, but we can also now do remote learning because we have put the infrastructure, the bandwidth into our classrooms that that is possible should the need arise. But I, I want to go back to your train um, situation. Fortunately for us, our terrain and our topography is the one like Mount Everest. It's <laughs> gradual yet undulating. So we have a little more time to respond to that coming train, hopefully. Right. Um, perfect. Ari, Shamari, we have time for one more question. I'm here in the back. <laughs> oh, I was, yeah, I was like, the voice of God. Where is that <laughs> One more question. So, um, oh, I thought you had the question. All right. So I, I actually get Actually, I do if you want I, me to. <laughs> I, I have, I have From conflicting because I got, you know, the notice on my phone, wrap up, wrap up, wrap up. So I was just about to, to, to wrap it up as well. Um, but seeing as, as Will is also speaking, um, Premier Emancipation Day isn't an additional holiday. It's a change of a holiday. Is that correct? Well. <laughs> just because I know. My Bible I, tells me to be ready in season and out of season. Yes. And I'm going to give you my personal view. Yes. And I'll put a dangling modifier to say that I have not fully consulted. I have flirted with the idea with most of them, but I have not got a consensus. Okay. So okay. I guess I'm going out a limb again. Um, the, the background for that was, I understand, well, the genesis for that, as I understand it, was at a Jamaica celebration at the Lions Center. Mm -hmm. And as you would know, Jamaicans in the house and those so affiliated, they celebrated on the 1st of August. So research was done, which I've had the fortune to read, that came and also used to celebrate Emancipation Day, and it was the first week of August. But then came along from what I read from a Mr. Murray, who did the report, um, a gentleman by the name of Ernest Panton, who was an administrator at the time, changed it from the first of August. And so it went away. And of course, you know, Cayman did not, still do not have a vast amount of plantations, and we never did really grow up celebrating slave or emancipation. If you were a slave, you're glad that you weren't a slave. And if you were a slave master, you should be ashamed that you had a slave. And so um, they thought that as we were going to look at culture and if you don't know your past, you wouldn't know your future. By consensus, it was agreed by the previous PAC government that they would celebrate uh, Emancipation Day, mm -hmm. but it would not be 1st of August. Mm -hmm. So um, discussion ensued, and the consensus was met where it would do it the first week of May. And because we already had Discovery Day, what we know known as Columbus Day, because we all grew up, I certainly did when I did my O-level history, that Columbus came to Cayman Rock, of course, first, <laughs> on the 10th of May, <laughs> 1503. <laughs> and so it's, for me personally, it's a hard pill to follow that his story or her story now becomes emancipation story, and we're no longer going to be celebrating um, Discovery Day because I believe it was said that some map was found somewhere and they saw the Cayman Islands on it, and it, wasn't, it didn't have the signature of Columbus, be that as it may. For me personally, I would like to reestablish Columbus Day or Discovery Day, um, but that would take a conversation between us and the private sector and obviously my colleagues, whether they want to do one or three things. Have two holidays in May, which is a bit much, put it back to where it was, August 1st, or put it in, for example, September and combine it with Labor Day when there's not a holiday, it's low season, and use it as a um, catalyst to get more local tourism or more international tourism. The jury's still out, but I've shared you my heart, as I do in all occasions. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, um, Premier. I know Will said one more question, but this one um, was just a little bit burning that, that I had here, and it has to do with um, population growth, the opening of new um, establishments like hotels, hospitals, housing issues have become more pronounced, and this is particularly affecting the lower income workers due to rising rents and the such. Does the government have any plans to address that problem specifically? Well, there is perhaps, again, two, three ways that it can be addressed. You can do it through immigration reform, and that would be adapting the methodology of your train, and that's not one that I am necessarily prepared to go at this time because we do not have sufficient amount of residents or locals who are able to take up um, those jobs. Um, I've given you all three, no more from me. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and besides that, you would have then either to encourage the builders of the um, infrastructure right. to increase capacity for visitors to maybe move to a hybrid situation where just as we did with planning when we were running out of space, we went to neighborhood commercial. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they can include temporary or permanently uh, residential aspect or quarters, like what we've done in Little Cayman. When Mr. Linton went in there, there were no private or public accommodation, so he built some accommodation for his workers. Right. And so sometimes you may have to make that investment. I mean, no, Mr. Linton said they didn't say they for free. So it is a probably longer term investment, but it's an investment which would um, really positively affect their profit in large um, profit and loss balance sheet. And so I believe that is an area that Chamber could assist with um, flirting that concept um, with the private sector to see whether they could um, meet with planning if necessary to get appropriate and necessary changes to do that because they have the resources, they have the property. I mean, government have some property and we've done that before when we had to incentivize or to alleviate or augment development or um, from a looming crisis. So I believe that there are um, presumptions there that, that warrants further discussion. And the other option is do nothing. And obviously you know me, I am not going to take that option. So I think that there is another area of, of entrepreneurship and thinking outside the box where we can meet that demand. Because I think it would be a travesty to just say, we're going to donate, um, deny every single work permit because we don't have nowhere for them to stay. That's not a solution, certainly not for me. Perfect. Thank you, Premier, for your time. It was a pleasure. You're most welcome.